Hi everybody, I'm Callan Bentley. I teach at Piedmont Virginia Community College, in Charlottesville, Virginia. But I am not in Charlottesville. I am in the Gallatin Range of Montana and uh, going on a hike um, up Highlight Canyon and um, come across these really amazing uh, examples of basaltic cooling columns. Um, the rocks here are Eocene in age, and during the Eocene, this part of North America experienced a lot of volcanic eruptions. Um, some of those volcanic eruptions were basaltic. So this is a mafic lava uh, that uh, was very runny uh, when it erupted, had a low viscosity and oozed out over the landscape. And then that lava cooled and solidified, and that made a rock called basalt. And then that basalt um, cracked. And these cracks define these blocks of rock that are columnar in their shape. Um, so this one seems to have four cracks on this side and five cracks on this side. If you hunt around here, you can find plenty of great examples. And um, here's a pretty nice one right here. All right which has uh, a bunch of these different facets to it. Um, this one's also kind of nice because you can see these um, features on the side of the cracks, on the side of the cooling column, that are about half a centimeter um, tall. And these are arrest lines. And they're basically fracture propagation features where the cooling of the basalt causes shrinkage and that causes contraction. And so these individual blocks of basalt pull away from one another, and the amount of that pulling is actually greater than the inherent strength of the rock, so it fractures. But each of these little slats um, basically represents a single fracture propagation event. So these little slats, they're each defined by a little horizontal line. These are these fracture propagation fronts, and you can see sometimes they curve in, and sometimes they curve out. So the tip of the fracture typically has a J shape as it grows. It has to go one way or the other. And so you end up getting these slight irregularities in the side of the column. And that eventually goes down through the solid sheet of basalt and divides it up into these columns. And these columns grow perpendicular to the cooling front. So usually what that means is, you know, they're vertical if the lava flow is completely horizontal. It's often more complicated than that. And even the growth of a fracture makes it more complicated than that because it gives a, a, an area for like steam, for instance, to vent out and that carries heat with it. And so that changes the shape of that cooling front and it can cause the columns to be wiggly or curved. Um, but if you look up at these cliffs here, you can see where all these columns are coming from. They're just falling off of these cliffs that are, I mean, it looks like a, an organ pipe uh, in like a cathedral or something like that. So many columns all uh, just falling apart here. There are millions and millions of them. Oh, and this is very exciting. I see a pica over there. Uh, a rare mammal that lives in rock piles up in the Alpine. Looks like a little Ewok or a teddy bear um, just crawled into the uh, cracks in the rock there. Cool. Um, anyhow, so um, I'm not sure which of these cooling columns I'm going to claim as my own and bring back home, um, but I think it's probably going to be the little one. The columns tend to be oxidized on their sides, so you get this sort of orangey, rusty kind of color. But then as they've fallen off the cliff, obviously they bang against each other and you can get, you know, a, a fresher surface. Like right here where you can see the uh, the original color of the basalt. And so those browns and blacks together make up the coloration of the, I don't even know if you would call this an outcrop, but a, uh, a geologic feature here.
All right. Silken Skeen Falls. So I'm up at Silken Skeen Falls, which is a little bit further up the valley uh, at highlight from the amphitheater where we saw those basalt columns a few minutes ago. Although it took me more than a few minutes to hike here. And Silken Skeen Falls is really worth the hike, not because of the waterfall itself, which of course is totally boring. It's just water and gravity, but um, the water and gravity have exposed some really cool rocks here. And these rocks are, are kind of awesome. These rocks are lahar deposits of the Absorca Volcanics. And the Absorca Volcanics are Eocene in age. And um, we're not exactly sure where the eruptive center was, but probably uh, over near the Absorca Mountains, the namesake of these. Um, volcanoclastic and, and volcanic units. And um, they're, they're a little thinner here, but they're, they're present uh, actually to great effect here in the Gallatin Range. So if you take a look here at the outcrop that I'm standing next to, you can see that there's one bed here that's like a meter and a half thick. And then there's another bed above that. And then it looks like maybe there's actually even like a lava flow there uh, immediately above that. But one of the things that'll strike you about um, these beds is they tend to be kind of finer grained at the bottom and get coarser grained towards the top, although this one finds out again. But this one here shows a very nice example of reverse graded bedding. All right, so the biggest pieces are at the top and they get finer toward the bottom. You can see it's finer grained at the bottom and then the grain size increases as you move up toward the top of the flow. And that's um, something that's actually pretty typical of volcanic mud flows. These lahars, they're um, very viscous um, and uh, as the, the grains are kind of grinding against one another, the small ones sift under the big ones and the big ones rise to the top of the flow. It's a phenomenon called the Brazil nut effect, which is named after a can of mixed nuts. If you open up the can of mixed nuts, the Brazil nuts tend to be at the top, not at the bottom, because the smaller ones sift underneath them. So this is evidence here of uh, really dangerous, violent volcanic mud flows that happened here like 47 million years ago relatively small gravelly kinds of size grains as we go up here to the top suddenly we get to this big boy which is riding along at the very top of this flow an eocene aged volcanic brazil nut well i've walked around the corner and kind of across to the uh, north of the trail that leads up to Silken Skeen Falls. You can hear it's a lot quieter because we don't have that stupid waterfall making all that noise. Um, but here's some really nice clean examples of these reverse graded beds. Take a look at this one here. And then this is the top of the bed. And then there's a new reverse graded bed that goes up to about right there. And you can see the grain size increasing as you go up. Really a spectacular example of this primary sedimentary structure that forms in volcanic rocks. Yeah. In order to be chock full of all these different colored and um, shaped chunks, um, those chunks have to first exist. All the chunks in a volcanic breccia are pieces of pre-existing rock. And in this case, they're pretty much all volcanic rock. So as a couple of examples of that, check out this one here. This is a rock type that I would expect any introductory student to know. It's fine grained and it's dark in color. This is a basalt. Basalt is fine grained because it cooled off rapidly at Earth's surface. Didn't have time to grow nice big crystals like a gabbro. And it's dark in color because it's iron rich rather than silica rich. And in contrast, you could consider this little guy much lighter in color, indicating a felsic composition, silica rich rather than iron rich. 
And it's chock full of holes. These holes look kind of like Swiss cheese holes. And this one isn't quite light enough to be considered a pumice. I would probably call it a vesicular rhyolite. Each of these little holes is a little volcanic burp preserved in perpetuity. We call them vesicles. But it was a really gassy eruption. And those gas bubbles, probably some of them popped and released gases to the atmosphere. But uh, rhyolitic lava is pretty viscous, and so it's easier to preserve bubbles without them popping. Also, we've got a pretty nice example here behind me of a, uh, a flow banded rhyolite. So here, this light colored clast um, has these nice little stripes running through it. These stripes are fine grained glassy material, kind of like obsidian. These lines right here were created probably as a skin of cooled material got folded into the lava flow as it moved over the landscape. And um, that indicates that some silica-rich magma made it to the surface, erupted as silica-rich lava that flowed over the Earth's surface. And as it flowed, it created these lines showing the flow direction. Then it solidified, and then that chunk was broken off and entrained in this lahar, uh, this volcanic mud flow that dumped the volcanic breccia. Here's another cool one. This is a little block of vesicular basalt. It's kind of cool because it's got a weathering rind on three sides, but not on the fourth side. So that tells me that this basalt erupted, degassed a bit, cooled down and made a solid. And then that solid was exposed to Earth's surface along three of its sides. And perhaps just before the volcanic breccia entrained it, then it broke again along this surface. So that didn't have as long to accumulate the effects of weathering. Neat little story to be told out of one single clast. Here's another example. This is a porphyritic rhyolite. So overall, it's got this red color. And then the little white specks that you see in it, those are feldspar crystals that nucleated and grew underground and then were entrained in the eruption and brought up to Earth's surface. So that's a porphyritic texture, F bigger crystals surrounded by finer grain crystals. Another neat kind of class that we see is this one right here. It looks almost like a little eyeball staring out at us, a cartoon eyeball. And here's another one right here. And then here's another one right down here. And they all, I think, are examples of obsidian that was entrained in the lahar. And then um, as weathering took place, they devitrified, and so they've got this uh, weathering rind on them, but it's really pronounced. And you can see here, like basically, you've got a spheroidal core of obsidian, and then this sort of chalky uh, exterior. The devitrified portion is so soft that I can actually scratch it with my fingernail. Another neat thing that you can see here in a couple of spots is this distinctive green color. All right, and you can see that's sort of pervasive throughout the body of the volcanic breccia. In some places, it's really pronounced. All right, that's malachite. It's a, a copper mineral, and it probably indicates that copper-rich fluids flowed through this lahar sometime after it was deposited. So that may have been associated with the uplift of this block, the laramide orogeny or maybe it's just some other geothermal event related perhaps to the Yellowstone Volcanic Center.